Good morning, Sabbath School members, and we are so happy that you could join us today. As you know, we are calling all the way from uh, Fairmont Seventh-day Adventist Church here in Lodi, California. If you step outside, there's a lot of smoke because all the, all the fires are going around in Northern California, but God is good. He's been taking care of us, and so today we are going to talk about making friends for God. And it's the same continuation of uh, the themes that we've been following. However, this is lesson number 10. So before we do there, go there, why don't we ask God to bless us, okay? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day you've given us, for all your many blessings. Pray that your presence would be with us as we start this lesson study, that you would guide us, open up our minds, that we might see glimpses of truth that you have for us. Thank you for your many blessings. We pray in your most holy name. Amen. We have celebrated some birthdays this, this week. One of my closest relatives turned 92 years old, and she looks as, my, that's my aunt, and she looks beautiful, 92 years old. Can you say amen to that? So today we're going to talk about making friends for God, lesson number 10, an exciting way to get involved. And this is all about small groups. I know the subject is kind of a, a dry one for us. So we're going to look into something very interesting. Look at the memory text. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is truly plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers for his fields, into his harvest. God has got special people. But before we go there, we want to look at the space. We are hurtling through space at an average velocity of 67,100 miles per hour. My goodness, can you imagine falling off of something like that? 67,108 miles per hour. Look at this, next one. Next one is Milky Way. It's spinning like a galactic pinwheel at a dizzying rate of 483,000 miles per hour. Do we feel any of that? That's not the end of it. Every day, every day, we are traveling 1.6 million miles through space. Even if you haven't done anything today, maybe you just got up from bed and just walked outside, just remember, you have traveled 1.6 million miles. It's amazing. It's amazing, this galaxy and this planet and so Earth is spinning around its axis at a speed of 1,000 miles per hour, and there's somebody that's connecting all this stuff. There's somebody that's taking care of this stuff. In the midst of all this, God has a special people caring for the world. Do you want to be that person? Do you want to be this group of Christians that gather together and pray? They're God's special people. So today we're going to look at small groups. What are these small groups? What is it all about? If you want to look at a church... If you want to keep a church growing, or if it's a church going, for example, I mean, if you want to maintain a church, you need to have goatee ministries, a potluck. Of course, I love those potlucks, don't you? Women's ministries, security, Sabbath school, elders, deacons, worship, greeters, divorced people, children, youth, men's audiovisual. I mean, where would we be without audiovisual? Goatee ministries, potluck, music, security. Ah, I left out the most important thing, the pastors. Every one of these groups is a small group that is maintaining the sanity of a church. Just think, if a church needs this, this many small groups, how many does God need? Oh, that's not, that's not the only thing. Then there are connect groups, right? Connect group is an intentional gathering of people where you can connect with others on a regular basis and share Interests, same age, experience, goals, etc., etc. Mothers, wives, single moms, sisters, etc., they have one connect group. And then you look at fathers, husbands, single dads, brothers, all the men, you have a connect group there. Recovering addicts, drugs, alcohol, prisoners, addiction, substance abuse. These guys all have a connect group. Pastors, car enthusiasts, car golfers, hikers, bikers, doctors, nurses, teachers. I mean, mechanics, it goes on and on and on. Anybody's got any kind of a horse in the race can have a connect group. But God has got a special group of people. 
There's God's special small groups. Today we're going to talk about this. See, when you look at this, 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 this group of people, and out of this group of people, God chooses a select group to do His will. And the gifts are involved with them. The gifts are embodied into them. The gifts are poured out onto them. And, these are, and then what happens is that God gets them all together in one spot. And then after that is over, he sends them out into different parts of the world. I know I'm losing some of you, but you've got to understand these things. Faith, scriptures, those are important things that hold the group together, God's group together. And a small group is a very important, vital group in our own midst, in our own churches, outside, even in the presence of God. So there are three questions you got to ask. Number one, who are these small group people? Define, you got to have a definition. Who are you? Number two, you have to go, why? Okay, why are you in a small group? What is the purpose of your small group? Number three, what have you accomplished in being a member of this, this, this? What are the results? Any one of these things is very important for the function. Number one, definition. A group of individuals who gain their strength through fellowship with God and with one another. See, this is the definition of a small group. Well, then what is their function? Look at the function. A group of individuals looking in the same direction with unity, thought, and action. Okay, you cannot be in one group and plowing out the other way, or you cannot be rowing the boat that way while the, everybody else is rowing it this way. You don't belong in that, in, that, in that group. And look at this one. Goal. A group of individuals who achieve their closeness to God through Bible study, prayer, and koinonia, which is fellowship. So you have these three things, right? Number one, you have definition, intimacy with God. You've got to get close to God. Number two, function. Why are you here? What are you doing? Okay, now number three, Goal. What is your goal? If any one of these three points, definition, function, goal, collapse, guess what happens? Your small group disintegrates. So these are very important in order, in order to define your, 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 your small group, in order to have a specific function, and in order to have a specific goal. God, my friends, specializes in small groups. He really does. And so we're going to talk about God's special groups. Look at all the people that God has. Adam and Eve was a special group, was it not? Just a core group of two people. Noah, with the family of eight. You have Abraham, called out of Ur. Moses, Aaron, Miriam. That was a threesome. That was a very important core group, was it not? They let the people of Israel out. And then you have Elijah on Carmel, who's going to be for God. And God says, wait a minute, Elijah. You're not the only one. I have 6,000 more that belong in the small group. How about the three boys, the three Hebrew boys? You mean to tell me there was only three Hebrew boys that stood up for God? That's what the Bible tells us. But how many were captured? How many were transported to Babylon? And look at the other one, disciples. The 12 disciples, right? But out of those 12 disciples, God chooses another core group, right? The three. And then you have the upper room experience where there's 120 gathered together. These are all small groups. And at the time of the end, there is going to be a small group of people, the 144,000. You see, during the, 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 the entire course of history, God has pocketed these special groups of people to guide the church, to guide his ministries. But the focus point of all of that is who? Jesus. You take Jesus away from the small group, it just becomes an other interest group. It no longer becomes a group that is geared towards salvation of others. It doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't anymore have that urgency, that, that care for others. It just, Jesus has got to be the center. Okay? So we have this. Two major things that keep, a, keep the small groups together. Faith, number one, and scriptures. Well, what is faith, you might ask? Well, let's ask, let's, uh, faith and active knowledge in God holds and energizes a small group. So what is faith? So faith, Martin Luther says, faith is a living, daring. I like that word, daring. In our stories today, you're going to find this living, daring. Daring confidence in God's grace, grace, things that you don't even receive. You're, you shouldn't even be receiving that. That is called grace. 
so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it 1,000 times. See, that is faith. And look at what happens again. Joel Olstein says, Faith is about trusting God when you have unanswered questions. Why am I here, Lord? Why is this Northern California burning away like it's nobody's business? Why is there so many unrest? Why are cities going crazy? God says, you know what? Trust in me. When you have unanswered questions, don't ask me why. Just trust in me. I'll take you through it. Well, faith, Ellen White, my favorite author, says this way. In place of our ignorance, faith accepts his wisdom. I like that, don't you? You see, I have a very limited understanding. I'm most of the times ignorant. I want God's wisdom. In place of our weakness, His strength. In place of our sinfulness, His righteousness. Our lives, ourselves are already His. Faith acknowledges His ownership and accepts its blessings. That, my friends, is faith. I like faith. Well, we can't just stop at faith with the focus on Jesus, can we? We had to go into the scriptures, right? I mean, faith has got to have its foundation on something. The Bible is God's word. Holy, divinely inspired, beautifully written, and immensely powerful. Crosswalk says that way. But you see, there is a movement right now around the world. Seems like we hear it all the time. Forget God. Take God out of religion. Take God out of everything around you. You're just here by yourself. And look at the next words, next scriptures. We are the Bibles, the Billy Graham says. We are the Bibles the world is reading. We are the creeds the world is needing. We are the sermons the world is heeding. You see, your life does not have to be very powerful. It doesn't. You know what? Most of the sermons are silent. Did you know that? A life led properly for Christ is the best sermon ever. Not just somebody like me preaching from the pulpit. No. You know what? A life that you live each day is a sermon. Scriptures, look what it says. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love, and with kindness I have drawn you together. At this time, God has God chooses a special group of people. Caesar Augustus comes in, Pax Romana comes in. I love Roman history. And during this time, Caesar Augustus says, you know what? The, 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 the empire, Roman empire, is too vast, too big. We can't put out the small little fires all over the place. There's 70 million people around. And we can't control everybody. So what we're going to do is we're going to declare peace. And we're going to call it Pax Romana. Well, in order for us to survive Pax Romana, guess what we're going to do? We are going to bring in the coffers. We're going to tax people and bring in the money into Rome. No more wars. So this Pax Romana comes into play, and this is, this is the Roman Empire from 31 B.C. to 240 A.D., 70 million people around this, this Mediterranean basin. Well, into this time, into this time, see, 70, 80, 70 years after the death of, I mean, 70 years after the birth of Christ, you're going to have Jerusalem completely destroyed, September 8, 70, 80. Well, where am I going with this? See, during this time, God gets a group of people, God's special group of people. And today we're going to talk about Christmas in August. Can we do that? We're going to talk about five groups of people, five groups of God's special people that God chose specifically as his own group of people. Look at this, number one. Who can we forget? What can we forget about this Emmanuel, which actually means God with us, the Messiah, who came to save us? Save us. And, 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 and the Hebrew is beautiful. Im meaning with, nu meaning us, el meaning God. Emmanuel, God with us. Beautiful language. And so we have these five groups of people, God's small group, group number one. Let's look at these this five groups. There's priests, there's shepherds, there's elders, there's virgin, there's, there's wise men. These five groups of people from different walks of life. Some rich, some poor, some learned, some not so learned. God chooses all these people for one purpose. See, we talked about the goal, right? Goal is very important in a small group. What are you achieving? We are achieving the Christmas story. We are achieving the fact 
that Christ was born. And God is going to orchestrate this. It's a beautiful story. The first one that we're going to talk about is Mary. Who can forget Mary? Look at this. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Wow. Look at this. The Lord is with you is actually Emmanuel. God is with you. Okay. Look, God, she, he says, angel went to her. Gabriel says, hey, you know what? Mary, I got news for you. You are highly favored. God has selected you. And you know what she says? Look what her response is. I am the Lord's servant. Mary answered, you can do whatever you want to with me, Lord. You see, in order for a small group to function, you have to have that complete trust and surrender and faith in God. And this is what she exemplifies. Then look what happens. She was picked out. One of my favorite authors writes this. She was picked out as the one God himself. Whoa. God himself chose to conceive, bear, and raise Jesus. And you know, this is such a sorry picture. It just makes me tear up. Mary was the grief-stricken mother who watched her wounded, bruised, beaten son nailed to a cross, to a cruel wooden cross, die. Wow, at that time, would you think that Mary knew about this? Well, look at Joseph. And there's a word when you read the scriptures, there's a word about Joseph that jumps out, and most of us kind of bypass that. It's that second word. He's so humble. He was righteous. And righteous, dekaios, he was a righteous man, merciful, obedient, hardworking. I mean, this because Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man. Here's that word, righteous man, righteousness. Did not want to expose her to public disgrace he had in mind and to divorce her quietly. He just wanted to take the whole thing away. But you know what? God talked to him at night, did he not? He says, Joseph, you're going to do what I'm telling you. Emmanuel, Mary, Joseph, they're both from the line of King David. And they were righteous, Dikaios. They're righteous. And so we have here Mary and Joseph. They wanted to have a fellowship with God, and God honored that fellowship. Their righteousness became a, a structure that looked to Jesus as foundation, as to God as foundation. And so when God looked at these two people from different walks of life, one is a divorced man, one is, I'm sorry, a widowed man, and the other was a young lady, young girl, a, barely 15, 16 maybe. And here God brings them both together and says, this is going to be my small group, and I am going to have Jesus come from this family. You have here, out of all those people, Mary and Joseph. Wow, what a story. What a story of God's special small group. Well, we can't stop at Mary and Joseph. Let's look at the second one. How about Elizabeth? Ha, huh, this is a very interesting story. Elizabeth was, um, <laughs> she was from the, she was a descendant of Aaron. If you know anything about Aaron, Aaron, Aaron was the first high priest, right? There were Moses, Aaron, Miriam. They led the people of Israel out. These guys came from the Aaronic dynasty, which is very powerful. Theologically, it was a very, very powerful group. And Elizabeth was there. And then she was also, she couldn't conceive. And here you have Zechariah. The name Zechariah actually means Zakor Yahweh. God remembers Wow, God remembers. Seems like God forgot, did he not? They're old people and they don't have any kids. And not having a son, not having a daughter, not having children. In that culture was a horrible crime, as it were. There are 24 divisions of priests at one time. And there were 20,000 priests living in Jerusalem. And there were 300 priests each day. And once in their lifetime, they went into the altar of incense in the holy place. Once every, once every lifetime. Can you imagine God remembering God, God bringing out Zechariah and our friend uh, um, Elizabeth? You see, it was a perfect marriage. Maybe not for us, but it was a perfect marriage. Elizabeth came from a priestly family, and here was a, she was a direct descendant of Aaron. And you have Zechariah, who was a Levite, a whole tribe that was dedicated to serving God in the temple. And it was a tribe of Levi. They were a perfect marriage, but something was missing. And the missing, missing link, as it were, is that they had no children. And God 
chooses these two people. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. God has remembered you. He has not forgotten you. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him Yuanai, Jonah, John. What a beautiful, beautiful story. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. You see, God is preparing his special group, his special small group. You see, that we have to have to have an example to follow. And God is giving us in the Christmas stories, God is giving us these beautiful venues, these beautiful little windows that you can open up and see what is happening. We are so engrossed in the Christmas gifts. We are engrossed in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the Santa Claus. Well, I have one of my patients who is a professional Santa Claus. Every time he comes to the office, he'll say, Hey, Doc, uh, it's 300 days before Christmas. I asked him the other day, and he says, Well, you know what? It's only another four more, five more months before Christmas. He, he knows exactly what's going on. He's tattooed all the way up. He looks just like a Santa Claus. Big old beard that he grows. And a big guy, big, chunky guy. Boy, I tell you, we get this Christmas stories messed up, forgotten into the hula of Christmas. The gifts, the caroling, all this stuff. We forget the reason why Christmas is there. John the baptizer, the voice in the wilderness. See, out of this entire group, God chooses Elizabeth, and he chooses Zechariah, and he chooses Mary, and he chooses Joseph. Well, the story doesn't end there, does it? There's still two or three more to go. Well, one more. Shepherds. Look at the shepherds. Very interesting, right? Well, look what they were, look what to who, you know, who were they? We got to understand who these people are. The shepherds, Abel, Jebel, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, Jethro, David, Amos. We could go on and on. Didn't these, 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 these guys were shepherds. Are the, the forefathers were all shepherds. In general, shepherds were dishonest. The Talmud says this. Dishonest and unclean according to the standards of the law, they represent the outcasts and sinners for whom Jesus came. Well, the rules of Judaism says this. To buy wool, milk, or a kid from a shepherd was forbidden on the assumption that it would be stolen property. Well, who were these shepherds? Well, I was reading this book and you should get it as well. The Rock, the Road, and the Rabbi. And it's written by Kathy Lee Gifford, very well put together. And the rabbi that she's quoting, quoting is Rabbi Jason Sorbel, Sobel. Very interesting book. He calls them the shepherd priests. Look at this. Look at this. These shepherd priests, who are they? They're Levitical shepherds who bred sheep for the temple sacrifices around the hills of Jerusalem. So they were not just regular shepherds. They were Levitical shepherds. They were Levites who had become shepherds because they, the, the lamb has got to be a pure lamb. It was for the sacrifice. And look at this. This is even more exciting. The lambs must be pure. They had ritually pure caves. See, when these, when these, when these uh, uh, sheep gave birth, the area has to be ritually pure. And so they had these ritually pure caves where they would take their, their little, little uh, sheep over there and, the, and, the, and, the, and, and, the, and and birth them there. The swaddling clothes were old priestly garments used to wrap up baby lambs. They did not want the... The, the priestly garments were never destroyed, like the garments of the high priest or the, the garments of the, of, the, of, the, of the priest that ministered in the altar. Remember, there were 20,000 living in Jerusalem at one time. Well, what happens to garments? Well, the garments are used for two purposes. It's used for the menorah to put out the oil and the lamp. And the tattered ones were given to these Levitical priests who wrap these baby lambs so that the baby lambs become ritually pure. And you might ask, where did Mary get those swaddling cloths? Zechariah was a priest. See how, see how the interesting story is there? It's beautiful. It's beautiful. Shepherds, yes. The shepherd priests found the sacrificial lamb of God dressed in priestly garments inside a ritually pure cave. So when the angel said, go to Jerusalem, go to Bethlehem, and I have for you uh, the, uh, the, 
in, in a manger, you'll find. Well, guess what? They knew exactly where it was. It has to be ritually pure. They knew a few caves, so they went to the, the exact location. They knew where the baby was going to be born. All the signs pointed to a sacrificial lamb. They knew when they saw this lamb, when they saw this Jesus, when they saw this baby wrapped in swaddling cloths, where the life is going to be ending up. See, God chooses, my friends. God chooses special groups of people. That is why the calling of God is so important. That is why you must know your gifts. That is why you, you should know where, where God is leading you, directing you. See, he calls up all these people, and the story doesn't end here in the Christmas story. God calls these, 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 these few shepherds, and you know we have found him. But the story of the shepherds is not the end of the Christmas story. We have another group of people, do we not? Well, let's take them over there. Let's go to the Magi, the Magnus. Who are these Magus? Who are these, 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 these magicians? Well, who are they is a good question. Because when you find the Persian Empire at that time, the time of um, about 500 B.C. and onward, before, and after that, the Persian Empire went all the way from Africa to India. It bordered in the Indus Valley. It bordered all the way down into India. That whole entire area at 500 B.C., was called the Persian Empire. And so from that empire, you get this magi coming through. Number one, they can be magicians, skilled in magical arts. Okay, number two, and, uh, and you know who was a magician also? You find that in Acts chapter 8. Simon, he was a magi. He was a magician. He was a cheap trickster. And look at this, number two. They can be wise men, astrological advisors, interpreter, interpreters of omen and signs in the sky. Number three, they can be kings. They could be in any one of these things. And then look at, look at what, uh, what, uh, what, what, what happens later on. Armenian tradition. The, you know, Armenian tradition says that they, could, they were kings. In the time of Daniel, they were wise men. See, Daniel was a wise man. He was serving the king in Babylon. Time of Esther, they were well-read advisors. And then Marco Polo comes along, and he said they were ancient rulers in search of one of their own. Wow, I like that. They were ancient rulers, went to look for another ruler that was born. That's why they could come back and they would say, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? See, this is a small group and God doesn't call him from Jerusalem or from Bethlehem. He calls him all the way from Persia. Look at that. Who has been born the king of the Jews for we saw his star when it rose and have come to worship him, Period. They knew what they saw. They followed the star. God's special own people. Finding the Messiah. Well, we have come to worship him. Magi. What a story. What a story. So you have these five stories, right? These five stories are very important. But the fifth one is the most important one. I like this one because here is Simeon and Anna. You know the story. The story is found in Luke chapter 2, verse 22 through 28. Here's a small group. Simeon was in the city of Jerusalem. He was a righteous and devout. He, and God promised him he will not die until he saw who? The Messiah. And he was in Jerusalem and he came to the temple ever so often. And he, when he sees the baby Jesus, he says, Mine eyes have seen the Savior. He had fulfilled the purpose, the reason why he was called. The reason why he was birthed. And he looks at Jesus and he says, here is Jesus. Here is the Savior of the world. Well, Anna is also a story, is it not? Anna, she was a prophetess. And you know what is interesting is that she lived, she was an 84-year-old widow, and she lived in the temple premise. And according to the temple rules, anything that is unclean cannot live in the temple. This woman is a widow. And guess what happens? She is out there ministering in the temple. She must have been one powerful woman. She was a prophetess, and she was in the temple, and Simeon was in Jerusalem, and she's in temple, and she fasted and prayed day and night. For why? For to see the Messiah. You see, this is a very important, touching story. And look, Sovereign Lord, Simeon says, as he sees the baby Jesus, he says, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you may now dismiss your servant in peace. You see, the function, the reason for his small group was over. And look at what she says here. 
coming up to them at that very moment, she gave thanks to God and spoke about the child to all who were working, work, looking forward to the redemption of Jerusalem. That was Anna. See, God chooses all these people. God chooses these five groups of people from different walks of life for one purpose, and that purpose was the birth, was the birth of Jesus. What a beautiful story. What a beautiful um, example we have. It is wonderful. Small groups must have three purposes. Number one, who are you? It should define your group. It defined all five of those people involved in the Christmas story. Number two, you should have a purpose. Why are you in that small group? All those five stories, they had that reason. Number five, what did you accomplish? What was the end result? They all found the Messiah. You see how beautiful God gives us an example in the Christmas story of small group? It is a beautiful story. And finally, we have not, we have not, we have not come, to a, come to an end yet. You see, there's a definition, there's function, and there's also your goal. These three things must govern the, the agenda. If it doesn't, your small group is gone. Your small group is no longer. And finally, the small group in Revelation 4, the throne room of God. We find this here. We find, then I looked, and there before me was the Lamb. And standing on Mount Zion with him were the 144,000 who had his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. It is a beautiful story. And they sing a new song, a song of deliverance, none but the 144,000. Here we go, a special group can learn that song, for it is a song of their experience, an experience such as no other company have ever heard. These are they which follow the Lamb wheresoever he goeth. See, this is the small group. And the time of the end, there will be the small group. And this will be the small group. And you know, my favorite author once again says this. She says, let's strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000. And let us do all that we can to help others to gain heaven. You see, you are placed in that small group for a reason. And the reason is this. There's only one reason. To bring others to Jesus. Go to that Christmas story. Go to the Christmas story and you find those five people had only one commonality. That common thread was find Jesus. And they all found Jesus. They all had special jobs. Elizabeth and Zechariah had a special job. They would announce John's birth. They would announce John would be there and, 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 and Mary would get the strength to go through this time of pregnancy with, with Elizabeth. And then you have this one purpose, Je, Je, Joseph. He was a righteous man. You find the shepherds. You find, uh, you find Anna and Simeon and you find the Magi from the east. You find that all these people had a special purpose. You see, in the time of the end, my friends, God is going to have a special group of people. And that group is called the 144,000. They will follow the Lamb wherever He goes. You will hear, they'll be filled with faith for God. and They'll be filled with the knowledge of the Scriptures. My challenge to you today is this. Do you want to belong to God's small group? I hope the answer is yes. Because He is yearning for someone who would respond to Him. So here it is. Let us strive with all the power that God has given us to be among the 144,000, that special group. And let us do all that we can to help others to gain heaven. Shall we pray? Father God, we come to your presence this morning. We thank you for the many blessings you have given us so freely and so abundantly, Lord. Forgive us for we have, where we have sinned. Lead us, guide us, guard us, protect us, help us, Lord. Mark us. Help us to be that special group of people, that 144,000, that will follow the Lamb wherever it will go. Wherever he might lead us, we want to follow, Lord. The bottom line is that we want to find Jesus. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Pray in your most holy name, in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Amen. Strive, my friend, to be one of those 144,000, to be in God's special group. Have a pleasant Sabbath. Thank you. God bless. As we finish this Sabbath,
let's remember one thing. You are God's special people. You are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. You are that special God's small group that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of Scotia, out of darkness, into his wonderful light. You see, Peter should know all about it. He belonged to that small circle. He belonged to that small group of people. And you are that people. Have a wonderful Sabbath.